Thank you, uh, Georgi, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, allow me to uh, present this uh, very nice thing that we are that is now implemented in the model code 2010. That there are some safety formats uh, that are applicable for nonlinear analysis. That means engineers finally, let's say, have some guidance how to. Uh, use uh, nonlinear analysis in some safety framework. So I will first uh, start by showing some examples of various classes of application of uh, nonlinear analysis uh, for serviceability, ultimate limit states, and also some uh, structural uh, detailing of structural elements. Uh, then mention a little bit, very briefly, the, some main aspects of the material models, uh, their validation. And then I will uh, show the four safety formats that are available in the model code and applicable for nonlinear analysis. So one uh, first example comes from a university which is in uh, northern Italy. It is a very modern design. And nonlinear analysis there was to check the serviceability limit, mainly to check the cracking and deflections. Uh, as you can see, this uh, university is a very slender structure. A uh, lot of uh, concrete elements are left visible. And it, the, it is a pre-stressed, uh, there are pre-stressed concrete elements. So that was, for instance, this case. You see these, uh, this, these are columns and beams. This joint is very, very much visible, left, to the, left open to the, to the, to the exterior and it is at the same time very slender and it was uh, pre-stressed. So here you see the normal reinforcement, here are some dimensions and here, here are the pre-stressing cables. And um, the objective of the nonlinear analysis here was to verify the crack width in these regions so that uh, the cracks are not visible to the public, of course, people might be afraid walking uh, in the university and seeing large uh, cracks. So here are some uh, parts of the 3D model, the deflections, and more important, the, uh, the crack widths calculated uh, by, by the software using the crack band method, which I'll mention later on. Of course, we also it's always important to make certain validations when using nonlinear analysis. One of the nice validations or comparison is, of course, to check uh, by 2D and 3D models. And in addition to the serviceability limit states, also the ultimate limit states uh, can be checked and was checked uh, by nonlinear analysis. Also, in many, uh, what was in this case, uh, investigated, making some kind of parametric study, what will be the ductility in these regions. Because, uh, of course, the model that we are using is a 3D, uh, 3D uh, model of, for concrete, which considers the triaxial state of stress, also the confinement. But uh, on the other hand, when it comes to modeling of concrete after reaching the peak, the experimental evidence is very limited. So we investigated various situations, situation when the concrete is very plastic, and then the situation when the concrete is very, very brittle. And here you see the various uh, calculated low displacement curves. And when checking the ultimate limit state, we need this global approach, which I will come to that later, where we increase the load up to failure and then of course we need to check the load the reached uh, peak loads with respect to the uh, level of the design load and of course up to now the the engineers were so to speak left uh, left get left in the open air what should be the safety factor that they should consider and this is where the model code now is very, very useful tool because it finally provides uh, some rules and some guidance in this uh, direction. 
Also, another aspect of this building was that there were no expansion joints. So, also, we, uh, let's say, larger scale model was created of the quarter of, or of a half of one of the story, uh, including, uh, this, of course, the pro some supports, loads. Uh, in this case, what was very important was the shrinkage and thermal strains, expansions. Here is some detail of the model around the, around the, uh, the elevator shaft. And, of course, reinforcement model uh, near the columns. And here you see some results. Uh, this uh, shows uh, the displacements from the permanent load. And then when it comes to the thermal load, you nicely see, due to the uh, shrinkage and temperature, you see how the crack develops between the fields and also near the columns. And uh, here is the picture of the reinforcement, stresses in the reinforcement, and more important also here we see uh, the development of the crack width in the middle, in the middle of the span. So this uh, shows uh, the crack width along with the deformed shape. So that was, let's say, a building where, where we were checking the service limit states as well as the ultimate limit state. And now I am showing another example, which is a bridge or it's almost a viaduct. Uh, not far, it's in, it's uh, near Prague. Uh, you see it's a very nice, uh, very nice structure with very slender columns. And the objective here was to use nonlinear analysis to verify one, some of the construction stages during the analysis. Because you see the piers are very, very slender. Of course, once the bridge is in, uh, or the viaduct is fully connected, it becomes a very stable structure. But uh, during the construction, there were some concerns about the stability. So first they placed uh, these uh, temporary stiffeners uh, in the middle of the piers. And this the, 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 bri the bridge or this viaduct was built by a cantilever method. So you see here one of the cantilevers at the point when it was almost completed. And now something about the model that we used. So here is a model of this cantilever uh, segment or uh, part of this bridge. Uh, foundation, including the piles. Uh, these are the slender piers. To model them, we used uh, uh, shell elements. They look 3D, but actually, uh, by, by geometry, they are displayed as 3D, but internally, they are calculated as shell elements. Of course, to model such a large-scale problem, it is not possible to use solid elements for the whole structure, so it is important to make use uh, of some of the more efficient element formulations like the shell elements or, or plate elements. So this shows the box of the, uh, of the bridge. This shows the individual segments as they were, this also shows the construction process because these segments were always built gradually and also gradually uh, pre-stressing tendons along the top uh, surface were, were uh, activated or also applied. Now, coming to this uh, ver verification by nonlinear analysis, uh, it is a little bit different from the classical approach because we have the various load cases, which in this case, this is, uh, for instance, the wind load causing suction and uh, pressure on one side and suction on the other side, wind, uh, wind, uh, acting from one side, of course, longitudinal wind, wind, and so on. So various cases were considered. And here are some results of the stresses and stresses in the cable. And now in one load case, this was the final failure mode by some plastic hinge or compressive failure at the bottom of the bridge girder. Uh, so this is this one of these load cases, which was the main one, uh, the most critical one. 
and I will come to a summarizing table. But this load case uh, was the load case where uh, we were checking the, uh, the weight or the load case of the weight of, from the concreting vehicle. And uh, this is, again, this typical evaluation I told you. So in, the, in this global assessment, what it means that for each load case, Basically, this kind of separate verification needs to be performed. So it is, of course, more demanding than classical linear analysis, where we can use, the, we can use with advantage the superposition of uh, load cases and also superposition of calculated internal forces. In nonlinear analysis, it is necessary to check each load case separately. So usually, it would be done for some critical structures and for the most critical load cases. So now what should be, in this case, you see the safety factor was about 1.7. And uh, uh, well, later on, we'll come to the, the solo safety factors, which now are available in the model code for, for, the, for the, the practical applications. So as you see here, here, are some, here is a summary of some of the load cases that we were looking at and for this case. Wind, you see very large load factor for, for failure. Uh, casting vehicle alone. But if we then consider all the loads uh, acting together, this was the uh, uh, load factor, which was 1.7, which was not that, that large. On the other hand, this was a, a construction situation where it is quite easy to control very well uh, the loading uh, acting on the structure. Uh, one last example uh, before going uh, into these theoretical aspects is a containment structure, nuclear containment. This comes from a project in Finland. I think this is the only containment which uh, is, has been recently completed in Europe nuclear, only nuclear power plant. Here you see uh, the geometry of the containment. It's a double wall containment. Interna the, the interior wall is pre-stressed. The outer wall is not pre-stressed. So the, the in interior wall is pre-stressed. It is supposed to uh, protect uh, the, the, the neighborhood from any accidents happening inside the uh, inside the reactor. And the outer building is more for protection against uh, outer, outer actions, for instance, plane crashing uh, to the containment. Now, ab something a little bit about the model. So this is the half or section through the finite element model. There you see the total model. There are some openings uh, in the building. And this uh, model consists of various elements. Again, as I have shown you already for the uh, for that bridge. So the wall is, uh, the containment wall is modeled by uh, shell elements, the ribs and the foundation by solid elements, and then inside the, uh, the containment there is a steel liner which is modeled by membrane elements. Uh, this is the description of the plate elements. So what we like to use is the plate elements or shell elements, which are actually 3D elements. Internally, they are formulated as a shell element, and, but they have displacement degrees of freedom only. And this then makes it very easy to connect, with, connect, it, connect such an element with uh, volumetric elements, for instance, for the ribs or for the, for the foundation. So in this way, one can easily use bending elements, that means shell elements, in the areas where bending uh, should be important. But in the areas where we want to capture shear failure, there we can use uh, solid elements. Uh, this is the, this is, there is the ring beam, but this only shows the wall. So this was shown a little bit on the previous side here. You see that the ring was by solid elements. Yes. Ring beam is solid elements. Yes. Yeah, here it is actually attached from the betwe between. So here are uh, solid elements which are attached 
to a shell element, shell elements on the inner surface. And then farther on, there is additional layer of these uh, membrane elements to model the steel liner. Very important in these structures are the pre-stressing cables. You see very detailed, it is important to have a quite good representation of these pre-stressing tendons because in the end the failure is usually local failure. So any deviation of the pre-stressing tendons can have an important effect. Uh, now how we, how to, what is I think important if when applying nonlinear analysis or to reinforced concrete structures or pre-stress structure like this one, it is very important to have a good uh, representation of the reinforcement and good representation of the solid model. Uh, we are using the well-known, and I think most softwares are using the well-accepted embedded approach in which it is then easy to define the reinforcement totally independently from the 3D model. And then later on, when the finite element mesh is created, the reinforcement is then separated into small truss elements, which are then embedded into the uh, solid finite element model. In this way, very complicated reinforcement shapes uh, can be, uh, reinforcement detailing can be modeled. And in addition, what it, this approach allows you to introduce here at these nodes that belong to the reinforcement, additional degrees of freedom to model the slip. And that means a bond slip law can be easily introduced. Uh, what is in pre-stress concrete? Of course, pre-stressing losses are important to consider. Uh, of course, there are some nonlinear techniques also that we, you can calculate the pre-stressing losses, but that means that each tendon should be pre-stressed one by one, also following the pre-stressing procedure, which might be quite complicated. So actually, in this case, what, uh, what, we, what was done uh, was that the theoretical pre-stressing losses were directly applied along each uh, tendon as initial strains. This shows the final fatal mode. Of course, this structure is actually is a concrete structure, but in the end, you can think about it as a steel structure because what in the end very much decides is the tendon yielding. Uh, so this is the final uh, yielding of tendons. This is the cracking of uh, the, the concrete wall. And uh, here you see the blown up, of course, increased deformation. The main, uh, yeah, the main, I forgot to mention, the main loading case in this situation is, of course, are some temperature loads, but then there is an overpressure which is gradually increasing, internal pressure. And uh, so the, the, this global check was by increasing the internal pressure following the deflections, and then there, we reach some final failure mode, which is very much actually it was very much controlled by the tendon yielding, and you see the safety factor, which was about 3.5. And in actually in various uh, containments that we analyzed, it was always around three, this the safety factor obtained. So which I think is good. Now, uh, non-linear analysis actually in most situation is used up to now to checking details. To check the whole structure is nice, but it is demanding. On the other hand, when you model the whole structure, the problem is that then uh, the model of various details is maybe too coarse. But on the other hand, usually details decide about uh, the problems or the structure uh, situations. So this is so far, I would say, not feasible to have the whole model of the whole structure and at the same time model each, uh, each structural detail that might be critical. So I just now will go through some details also where nonlinear analysis is used. So in case of this uh, containment, typical detail is either the buckling of the liner. And uh, this buckling of the liner, of course, then brings the problem of anchoring the liner into the concrete. So this is, shows a typical situation how, this, uh, how the liner is usually anchored. There are some studs, and at the same time there are some 
I shape or L shaped uh, uh, steel elements to which the liner is uh, welded. So, and the load case scenario for such an anchorage is again main loading scenario here is a accident it's called local loss of coolant accident which introduces first of all pressure but at the same time higher temperature the higher temperature will heat up heat up the liner and the liner will buckle up once it buckles it will introduce uh, non uniform loading on the on the anchor and then this may result in some cracking and some failure mode and then nonlinear analysis could be used to calculate uh, and, uh, these exp these um, uh, this load displacement behavior of these anchorages. This is an example of the buckling of the liner. That's because one of the important design criterions in these in the containments is the is that the strain in the liner should not exceed certain values. Problem is that such a evaluation is very 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 I would say old-fashioned because the strains could be very large if you think about some details, connection of the, of the liner to these anchorages. So when checking by nonlinear analysis, you, the strains will be whatever uh, size you, whatever value you want, depending on the finite element size that you select. Oh, yeah, also we participated in uh, a round robin analysis, which is now being organized here in uh, India, uh, in, uh, in BARC, Baba, Baba Atomic Research Center. They built this containment, uh, which is a one to four model, and they are now organizing some round robin analysis of this. But uh, as far as I know, they have not yet, th their idea is to bring it up to failure but this so far uh, has not been achieved, and I think uh, Dr. Joklekar had some presentation about that during the conference. 1.56, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, they put some liner inside some. Yeah, so we predicted the failure, which you see here at about this pressure, but uh, so far it has not been verified. Uh, so now going to a little bit about the material models and theory, there are various commercial softwares. I would say I listed here three, uh, which I would say contain the most sophisticated concrete models, but of course there are many others. So when using nonlinear analysis, the typical situation is that most softwares introduce some advanced uh, material models, which uh, then always divide the nonlinear analysis into a incremental and iterative process. In each, incre in each increment, there are iterations First, there is an elastic predictor assuming elastic behavior, and then the stresses throughout the structure are checked with respect to the criteria and are reduced uh, by uh, calculating the proper stresses in the material, and then it inter uh, by integrating them, we come up with some internal forces, and then this difference between the internal forces and ex applied forces introduces some residuals which are then iteratively redistributed uh, throughout the model. Uh, <coughs> what is important when modeling uh, concrete structures is to, let's say, cover these effects. Concrete cracking, confinement, shrinkage, creep, reinforcement, uh, yielding of reinforcement, hardening of reinforcement, and of course, rupture of reinforcement. Uh, important is bond, modeling of loss of bond between uh, reinforcement and concrete. And of course, some contact problems can be an issue because various materials uh, may, uh, be in con may be used in our structure and the interface properties should be addressed. 
well, going to the material model itself for concrete, typically most of the material models work uh, along the line of the strain decomposition. That means that the strain, te strain tensor is decomposed into elastic part, plastic part, and fracturing part. Fracturing part usually uh, addresses the cracking. Uh, plastic part usually uh, resolves in the steel, the plastic behavior, and in the concrete. Uh, the compressive uh, crushing of concrete. Uh, regarding modeling cracks, which uh, is an important part because the crack, cracks always occur, even under service, service, uh, serviceability situation. Of course, when it comes to ultimate limit, ultimate uh, limit states there the compressive failure or reinforcement yielding or reinforcement rupturing becomes uh, the dominant mechanism. What I th I'm showing here is one of the main models which is up to now um, used by most softwares to model the cracking. This is the so-called smeared crack model where we where it is assumed that the crack which in a real situation is a single line is somehow smeared over the element and then uh, this uh, kind of simple equation is used to translate the strains which we usually have uh, as our um, kind of a driving parameter inside each finite element to translate these strains into crack opening displacements and then we can go to the softening law for concrete and in this way, we can properly take into account the energy dissipation during the cracking process. Uh, the important parameter in this formula is the size of the crack band. Uh, in ideal situation, we can assume that inside an element, there will be one crack. Uh, and then we can say that this crack band size is the size of the element perpendicular to the crack direction. This is a good approach. Uh, it is also, I think, important that this crack band is calculated on the element level. In some softwares, it is an input parameter. But then it means that you should use finite element sizes, which are more or less square, and uniform all over your model, which in many situations is a very restrictive uh, condition. Uh, the other issue you, we have to keep in mind that if you come to reinforce concrete and if you use large elements, let's say you model the containment, there, there the element size maybe is one meter and you, you, it's reinforced, then this assumption that there is a single crack inside one finite element is not true anymore. So this also should be somehow addressed uh, by the software that uh, once it is reinforced, then we need to make this uh, equation a little bit more complicated. Well, what this equation means, finally, it means that when we have the localization of crack, that it localizes into a single element, which I told you in heavily reinforced structures and when using large elements may not be true because in reality there may be more than one crack inside the finite element. But this is this uh, assumption and uh, uh, good, good method how to address this, as I, told, as I have already mentioned, is this uh, crack bent approach. The good thing is that it can then capture also the size effect. So uh, nonlinear analysis will automatically take into account the size effect of your structure at least the energetic size effect. Sometimes there is also a statistical size effect, so this one, of course, uh, cannot be uh, addressed by this model, but this, the energy, the energetic size effect uh, can be very well captured. Now a few validation examples. A typical validation example is to model the tension stiffening, which, uh, which is a typical or classical situation, bar embedded in concrete. If you pull it, you will obtain this kind of behavior. Finally, there is the yielding, finally the response is given by the yielding of the bar. And this part we can consider tension stiffening, some additional stiffness of cracked concrete. And uh, it is of course also affected by the bond behavior. And what 
we also, we, I would like to show with this example is that this uh, tension stiffening effect, also the bond effect, is can be addressed without any, any without any need of a special bond model or special stiffening model, if sufficiently fine uh, finite elements are used, because all these effects actually are very could be very nicely represented by suitable model for cracking of concrete. But again, if we come to modeling large structures with large elements, a lot of reinforcement, then you cannot use such a fine mesh around each reinforcement. Then bond models or tension stiffening models uh, are useful. Uh, <coughs> also, the proper modeling of concrete cracking can very nicely represent uh, crack spacing and crack width, which is shown on this example. And when modeling uh, 3D structures, what is important is to consider the 3D state of stress, the typical uh, triaxial failure for concrete has already been shown here in this morning. And uh, while well, this, of course, this criteria can be easily incorporated into, into any finite element solu uh, solution and then obtain the confinement effect. So uh, when validating numerical models, one should divide it into three, let's say, levels. First thing is to be able to reproduce material tests. That means compression test, tension test, triaxial tests. Uh, then uh, there is a, always will be when modeling with fi finite elements, we always there will be an issue of mesh sensitivity. So every engineer using nonlinear analysis when modeling some structure, uh, certain structure should make some sensitivity study. Should at least use two, three models to evaluate the mesh sensitivity of his model. And then what uh, we uh, are proposing and should be also the solution to the model uncertainty because each, each uh, software is, is using certain models. It is very difficult to provide any general guidance to this model development. So the only way how engineers can obtain some, uh, let's say, some, uh, some confidence in the model or software they are using is to simulate some benchmark problems, to simulate some shear problems, and in this way get the feeling how the software behaves in these, uh, for these types of problems. Yeah, I'm showing some benchmark where, where we recently participated. Uh, just to give you an idea of what I mean by these benchmarks. Uh, this was a uh, uh, experiments which were performed in Zurich by Professor Marty. He simulated these kind of slabs in shear with different geometries, different uh, reinforcement arrangements. And uh, here you see some results from this benchmark. Each, each box corresponds to one participant. And there, uh, the horizontal axis is an error in displacement. On the vertical axis is the error in strength prediction. And each point then corresponds to one, uh, uh, speci one uh, specimen arrangement. So, and that you see that it is, even for these relatively simple problems, still it is not so easy to predict, uh, to obtain good prediction. Uh, actually, the winner of this uh, competition was Professor Kolleger. These are his predictions. Mainly, he, he was the, announced to be a winner because his predictions from engineering point of view are a little bit underestimating the strength and overestimating the deflections. From engineering point of, from engineering point of view, it's a good prediction. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, we should say that he used an approach by hand, more or less, yes? So for these simple problems, it is quite clear that the engineering knowledge is here from experiments. So it is, of course, the hand calculations very often give very good results. 
Also, he was in the same group as these people, which are in his group, and they did analysis by using Athena, all software. But why we like to show it is that it, these people, they did not communicate with us. They did it totally independently, and they obtained quite good predictions, in, mainly in terms of strength. Our predictions had the best predictions in terms of strength, but we a little bit uh, underestimated uh, the displacements. But actually, what was the case? We underestimated the ductility. So which, on the other hand, you may say is actually also on the safe side. Because what happened, uh, these experiments were quite ductile, and uh, we predicted quite brittle failure. <coughs> Another benchmark comes from. Predicting the ductile area, did you use the actual stress test curve of the displacement or the particle stress test curve which are shown in the course? Because they are quite different. Well, there was no pre stressing. Just you, say, you said pre stressing, but this is not pre stress. This is, but this, this is reinforced. But uh, I must say, I don't remember now. I think we used something uh, between. Yeah, we used uh, some hardening, bilinear uh, model for steel, and hardening was based on the, exper on the experimental data they provided. The problem here is the compressive behavior. Because then it's a shear problem, so it is very much dominated by crushing of concrete. And uh, uh, if you used to, d to brittle, uh, let's say, softening behavior for concrete in compression, that was the main problem here f for our analysis. And it's also shown here. Uh, this is another benchmark from France uh, organized recently by this project GEOS, or CEOS, I think it's called. CEOS, yes. Uh, so one, one example was this wall. Here you see the experimental response, and here you see the numerical result for 2D, 3D, but of course, again, if I, I told you, like in the previous case, if we use, let's say, the default settings which are in our program to make sure that the engineers get behavior on the safe side, uh, and these behaviors a little bit underestimate the ductility of the compression failure, then you obtain uh, uh, lower, lower peaks. So for 2D, it is quite, quite natural that to have a 2D model of the confinement region, it is really needs to be in the model. It cannot be calculated automatically. But the 3D models should capture the confinement uh, of this crushing region. So now uh, coming to these global models, uh, global safety formats. So if we just uh, rephr uh, rephrase what is the current approach, Currently, when making design or checking the structures, we apply uh, forces to our structures, and then we calculate the internal forces in some critical sections. And that at each critical section, we check if the actions are design actions, including, of course, all the uh, partial safety factors on the load side, if they are smaller than the resistance of the section, which again includes all the partial safety factors for the sectional behavior. So now when we, uh, this is not very suitable such an approach for nonlinear analysis. So for nonlinear analysis, it is better to apply uh, the loads on the structure, keep increasing them until the, f until the failure, actually this, we, and then we calculate the resistance not of the section, but the resistance of the structure with respect to the given set of loads. And then we will compare that to the uh, load level. So this is, a, in a sense, more correct approach because it eliminates the uh, the discrepancy in, the, in this classical approach, because in this classical approach, what is usually happening is that to calculate the forces, we use linear analysis. But then to calculate these resistances, 
we assumed highly nonlinear behavior, so which is a little bit uh, discrepancy here. So this uh, this uh, this discrepancy is eliminated in this approach, but of course at some additional cost because we cannot we cannot use the superposition, and also the analysis are more demanding. So this is the basic design condition we have. And now, how do we calculate this design resistance? Now, in the FIB model code, there are three uh, possible approaches. First one is, of course, the full probabilistic analysis. That means to make kind of Monte Carlo simulations by defining uh, various, making several analyses, in each analysis using different uh, strength of concrete, different uh, strength of reinforcement. And when do you doing this probabilistic analysis, there are two possible approaches also, one called vari uh, random variables or random fields. But I don't want to go into detail, but it is clear that with this approach, which is the most demanding, but we can actually get the information about the mean, information about the distribution, and we can then calculate the design resistance uh, considering uh, some probability of failure. There are other, well, one more thing coming back to this probabilistic analysis I want to note is that even though it looks very complicated, nowadays it is feasible. There are statistical approaches that can limit the number of analyses that you need to perform to, let's say, 30 even, yes? Which is feasible even with nonlinear analysis. Uh, now, global safety factor, which would be the most, the easiest way how to do it and the most natural. That means we calculate the mean behavior of our, the mean resistance of our structure, and then we apply some safety factor to come up with some uh, design resistance. And this would be, of course, also quite natural extension of the current way of working. Of course, when we do it, we have to realize that we have no information about the distribution. It could be that uh, there might be a problem that the distribution of our structure is totally different what for, from what was assumed when formulating this uh, safety factor. Or a partial safety factor approach where, of course, we don't know anything about the mean. We also don't know anything about the, uh, about the statistical distribution. Now, when I'm talking here about the partial safety factor, uh, please don't get it confused with the classical approach. Here, we call it partial safety factor, but that means when calculating this design resistant, resistance, we make nonlinear analysis as an, as, and as input parameters into the nonlinear analysis, we use the design values of material parameters. That means we multiply the compressive strength of concrete by the partial safety factor, same thing for the steel and so on. Uh, so, and we can say that the resistance calculated in this way, we can consider it to be an estimate of the design resistance. How accurate it is, that may be a question. There are, of course, some uh, theoretical uh, arguments that it may not be always on the safe side. Uh, but that's what uh, I would like to show in subsequent examples that so far we haven't discovered a case. But it uh, doesn't mean that such a situation doesn't exist. Uh, and one more, one, we have one more method, which is also included in the FIB model code, which is already introducing a little bit the probabilistic aspects. And we call it uh, ECOF, estimate of coefficient of variation. And in this method, we make two analyses. One using average properties, and this we consider to give an estimate of the mean resistance. And then another analysis using characteristic values. And we consider this to be an estimate of the characteristic resistance. And if you do that and we make assumptions that the distribution of resistance is log normal, which is quite realistic and accepted by 
almost everybody. It is then possible to make an assumption of the coefficient of variation. Then based on that, it is possible to, cal to calculate the uh, global safety factor, considering uh, the beta reliability index, which has been mentioned many times during this conference and also during uh, this workshop. So it allows us to consider the probabilistic uh, aspects or give some probabilistic uh, input data. Nice thing is that by making one analysis with characteristic values and one with uh, mean values, at least partially we get some sensitivity to the concrete strength and to the uh, reinforcement strength. Because the concrete strength typically varies much more while the, uh, while the difference between the characteristic and mean strength of reinforcement is not very, uh, is not much different, difference. So, and when we have that, we can then really, from the mean value of resistance, calculate the design value. There is one more approach, which is, comes from Eurocodes, which also is nice in the sense that only one analysis is necessary. This analysis is uh, calculated, so to speak, mean value, but it is not mean, really mean value, because to, use, to calculate this resistance, we use mean values of re for reinforcement, but uh, values for concrete are not mean, as you see here. They are even lower than the characteristic one. But in this way, it is possible to introduce the heterogeneity, the higher heterogeneity of the concrete with respect to the reinforcement, and then to have, some, uh, have a single value of the global factor. On the other hand, this global factor is quite, quite low. I must say, uh, I would be a little bit afraid to design a building using nonlinear analysis only with this, uh, this safety factor. But what we did, we evaluated, and I want to show you the, this summary of this study. We checked all these uh, four safety formats on some examples which we like to think cover kind of the range of typical problems in uh, reinforced concrete design. So starting from a simple beam, with in which, uh, has a, which is dominated by bending, shear wall, uh, bridge pier, which includes some secondary effects due to large deformations. Uh, this is a bridge which was tested up to failure in Sweden, so we also use it as a reference example because we have some information about the true, uh, uh, true strength. Another uh, examples, again, shear beams. We have several shear beam examples, actually three, because shear is a very critical, uh, critical behavior in reinforced concrete structures. So these are beams tested at Toronto some with reinforcement and some even without reinforcement, without shear reinforcement, and very high beams. You see they are two meters high. So the size effect comes, the size, effect, size effect very much uh, comes to place, comes to, uh, needs to be considered. Here's an example of the behavior for these beams. I think this is the, with the shear reinforcement, and this one was uh, without the shear reinforcement, yes? Here are some results from the calculation, comparison of the failure pattern. Uh, <clears throat> and this shows, just to give you an information, of this probabilistic approach. So when we make the probabilistic approach, in this case we, use, we are using the random variables method. That means we prepare statistical inputs, but for each beam, there is a single value of compressive strength or single value of uh, tensile strength. So each beam has the sa has same properties, but different set of properties are created for different beams. We have some statistical tools for that, which are based on uh, random sampling by latent hypercube method. And now, just to give you an idea about the results, I, will, I have selected the most critical case uh, where we see the highest differences from the, let's say, standard design formulas. But that's because that's the, the deep shear beam from Toronto 
without shear reinforcement. Probably no one will design such a beam without shear reinforcement. But you see here the, uh, the statistical distribution obtained from the probabilistic analysis, and here you see the results. So that method where we use the partial PSF means the partial safety method, that is the method when we use material design parameters with, uh, with uh, the safety factors in the nonlinear analysis. So this gives uh, this uh, 213 design resistance using the euro code, this value, using this coefficient of variation approach where we have two analyses, we are somewhere here. Then the probabilistic approach was somewhere here. This was the characteristic value from the probabilistic approach. Here was the mean value from the probabilistic approach. Here is the experiment. So as you can see, one always has to be also, one always has to be a little bit, uh, understand that usually the experiments that we have are not the mean. And for these cases, they don't make so many experiments because it's important, so they made three experiments. So still probably it is not the true mean. Uh, what is interesting that here would be the uh, Eurocode formula and here would be the ACI formula. Yeah, so it definitely stops working for these uh, large beams where the size effect is important. And now the summary, this table summarizes all the results from these, uh, how many, six examples. We have actually extended this table. I was showing it uh, during the conference also for some fiber reinforced concrete. And what you can see, this table, first of all, to understand what it is. So th these are the individual, each row is the individual example. I each column is the method, those four methods that I was mentioning. And it is normalized with respect to the probabilistic approach because we can say that the probabilistic approach is the most correct one. Also, what I want to point out is it very much depends how you make the probabilistic approach, because as it was pointed out by previous speakers, if you do probabilistic analysis, it very much depends what, you what kind of distribution you consider for the material parameters. So when developing the probabilistic approach, what we did is that when defining the statistical distribution for, the, for instance, for the compressive strength, we used normal distribution, which kind of, I think, is the, used in the code, and we selected it such that it goes through the mean and it goes through the characteristic strength. So try to be as close as possible as would be the standard uh, approach taken in the, or assumed in the, in the code. Uh, but then I think for resistance, it's also important that with our method, we have to make an assumption about the distribution of resistance. And there we used uh, log normal distribution. So what we looking at this, what was surprising to us is that there is no difference. Looking, I would say there is no difference, sort of. So there is, we couldn't, cannot, find, cannot find any preference for in either of these methods. So if there is no preference, I am myself always saying, well, why then not use the simplest one and the most natural one, which would be to the engineers. And in my opinion, the most natural one to the engineers is the PSF method. The one where they make the nonlinear analysis using the uh, partial safety factors. Because also if you think about this method, what this method is actually doing is that as you increase the load to the design level, it checks all the sections. So it actually is doing what the standard design is doing. That it is basically checking all the available sections, even those that you would not check normally. But this advantage of this PSF approach is for instance that maybe it may be, it would be then uh, difficult to use the same analysis to check the serviceability limit state because you are using so low properties that the serviceability limit state check may be too conservative. So the other method that is favorite of mine is this, this one from Eurocode, where you can almost then have single analysis 
and use it to check both ultimate as well as the serviceability limit state. Uh, other aspect is the model uncertainty, which so far is, uh, should be encountered. And so far, there are some provisions in the model code, in the probabilistic model code, as it was mentioned by Professor Mancini in the morning, there are some values going from 1 to 1.1, which is probably too low. And we, there is some more work that should be uh, done here. Right now, our approach here, or our suggestions for engineers is to make this benchmark, to analyze some benchmark cases, shear problems, bending problems, to get a confidence in, in your model. OK, so I think I will conclude here. I think also I mo more or less summarized the conclusions already. Uh, I would say the most accurate method would be the probabilistic one. The ECOF would be the second uh, method which already introduces some probabilistic approaches. But it is probably still a little, still little bit more demanding, so it will be used probably really in some most uh, extreme situations or for some safety critical structures. And uh, otherwise, this PSF method or this uh, Eurocode method are the most suitable one. The PSF method has an advantage also that you can quite easily explain it to any certifying body. If you need to have your analysis certified by some independent authority, it's easy to explain them. Yes, I'm using the partial, partial safety factor for compressive strength. And uh, while this Eurocode one is already starting to be a little bit more complicated for, for, the, for, 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 for them. So thank you for your attention. And of course, if there are any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Yeah, totally two questions I have. Mm -hmm. uh, one is that once we carry out this uh, nonlinear uh, finite element analysis, then second order, order effects like uh, slenderness effects and all, we need not consider separately, I suppose, I, if you can please confirm. Uh, I'm sorry, you? Second order effects yes. like uh, slenderness effects and all that, which we otherwise add on as additional bending moments, etc. I suppose they are not required to be carried out separately because this will be automatically built into the analysis that we carry out. Is that right? Yes, usually any nonlinear finite element code which can handle material nonlinearity can also consider large deformations. So it is not a problem to automatically include it in the analysis. Right. Other thing is you mentioned that uh, you have to go on increasing the loads for the failure to arrive. And then you work out the, you, you know the design loading, so the factors, and you get the safety factors and therefore you determine whether the structure is safe or not. Yes. So for this, I think you have to first define your limits when you say it's failure. For each element, the limits of failure would be different. It could be a limit of maybe cracking or maybe deflections or maybe, I don't know, something else. So can you just throw some light on this? Yes, this is a important question or important issue. You are right. Uh, well, typically when we do this kind of analysis, as a failure, we consider really the collapse. So as you see here, we keep increasing the load until we really see that the load does not increase anymore. It is going down. So of course, you need to have some special uh, nonlinear solution techniques to be able to go into post-peak. Uh, but on the other hand, from practical point of view, very often you can also have a different criteria that you say that the deformations are so big or that the, the strains, uh, maybe in the tendons are so large that there'll be a rupture of tendons. So you can consider that as a, as a peak load or as a, as a, as a, as a failure load. But uh, you, you really should be uh, careful in this that, uh, that, uh, uh, that this, that what you consider as a, as a failure load is really some kind of meaningful failure load. If it is not just uh, some side effect of your analysis, let's say, yes? Uh, one question, sir. Yes? 
in the methods which we have used it's not necessary to have any kind of prior knowledge about what is likely to happen because what it, what will happen will be brought out by the analysis itself but in a design offices there could be i am saying could be a more simplified approach and that is to uh, to try to identify the type of failures mechanisms which may lead to a failure and you don't know which one will lead to a failure in which case uh, what one could do is if you are say calculating the failure of a beam by bending of the reinforcement because normally we design under reinforced sections not the over reinforced sections so we know that the critical this mode failure will be governed by the steel failure in which case it is simpler to assume the steel at the characteristic level we know the actual steel is higher than that but assume it to be the characteristic level and let all other elements to be chosen randomly mm. uh, wherever they fall to i mean they will not necessarily be at the mean value or the lower value or the, wherever they fall to be and make few uh, trials like that and then you know that if it fails by reinforcement stressing then the failure load is some x value then you do the analysis that uh, in spite of all that what i have said maybe there are effects in the structure which i don't, can't understand because the structure is indeterminate nature and the exact strains and forces are unknown in which case i say okay let let it be failed by the concrete strength crushing and then hold the concrete only at the characteristics value lowest value and let all of us run uh, by the by the statistical measure choose at random now if you can do such two or three analyses uh, will it at least i understand it by physical feel more than what is happening instead of using this sort of black box methods uh. Well, I don't know what you mean by black box methods, yes. <laughs> black box because, is simply, uh, sir, no, you're, I will tell you. If you think what, about it in this way, I, I, I will tell you what I mean. you are using is also a black sir, box. Sir, if you are using the plate element or something, mm. it, it doesn't use all, uh, it, it, it uses only few degrees of freedom. It's not a real estimate of what happens. Therefore, a bending an analysis which is quite correctly producing bending moments or something using one type of uh, element is not necessarily representing the other, other effects quite effectively and in that sense mathematics is inadequate for for bending elements it, it gives yes. only particular that type of solution yes. Yes. Uh, that's I, why I, that's why i was mentioning I mean, I, sir in the old days the greatest challenge was to choose the right kind of element yes. to describe your structure and i have, I have known the plate and shell element structures deep structures being used by the wrong element and coming to totally wrong results yeah, that's always the danger when using finite element analysis. This danger is doesn't matter if you are using linear or nonlinear. This problem is always there that somebody is using wrong elements. Uh, and your question or your comment, if I understood it correctly, about uh, the beam elements or bending elements that they not capture the reality. That's why I was also mentioning that for some of these critical situations, we distinguish that we use bending elements in the area where bending is the dominant and in the areas where shear may be the dominant problem, there it is better to use uh, solid elements. That's, that's what I meant, yeah. Of course, it is right. then becomes, the model becomes more complicated. There's also the issue of compatibility and condensing at the nodes and all that. That will arise. That's obvious. So choosing the element from the library is to almost know what you want to see as failure modes. So you choose the elements which can model that failure mode in that region. Is that what you say? Is that, that's the point, isn't it? That's right. But on the other hand, uh, this, of course, uh, is depends always on the engineer using the tool. Yeah. If you met, uh, if it, if the engineer is uh, let's say good and understand what he's yeah. doing, then he should be able also to detect that let's say I, I, he's used bending elements, but even the bending elements calculate shear. Yes. And then when he could see that the shear in some regions of his model are becoming a little bit higher, 
then uh, maybe switch to brick. Then, then, is, uh, then it is safe. Then he should somehow either check, make separate checks in these regions or uh, make the refinement there and use a different, a different element. Yeah. And the other point I was just thinking long ago, uh, there used to be something called a quarter point collapse on the, on the shell element to model fracture problems and things. Um, I don't know if it's still being used. What do you mean? On the shell element, quarter point collapse, you know, to model the yes. crack directionality and, and that, that, that used to be a specific technique which we used to use in ANSYS and LUSAS and all in the old days. Yes, this is I don't know if it's still being used or it's outdated. No, this is a technique which was typically used to model linear elastic fracture mechanics, propagation, stress singularity at the crack tip to use high order elements and then put the uh, middle point to a quarter point position, yeah. which then automatically introduces the stress singularity yes. there. Yes. Uh, we don't use this approach for two reasons. First of all, uh, linear elastic fracture mechanics is not considered that uh, suitable for concrete, because there is usually a quite large process zone, zone where uh, the cohesive stresses are gradually dissipated. So, yeah, this is a standard approach to modeling cracks. But in, in reinforced concrete, there are usually so many cracks, so many micro cracks, that to model each crack by this technique would be too, too demanding. 